Thank you very much. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Pradeep intercepted me when he knew I was coming to Delhi for the consumer conference this morning. So uh, he gave me choice with democracy because he's been very, very friendly and supportive in uh, anchored activities over the past four and a half years that I've led this organization. And it gives me a very unique privilege to get to meet uh, members of the intellectual leadership uh, on some key issues that are of interest to us. Uh, what I'm hoping I can do is to, in a fairly intelligent way, say some very simple things. Um, my main argument is following. Uh, the current form of globalization, which basically starts growing around the same time as uh, the BPO starts uh, having gravitas in rewriting the rules of market access, but coincides with uh, untamed neoliberal assumptions that if we open markets, they'll fix everything on their own. In its early phase, was very suspiciously viewed from the developing side as another as new form of imperialism, as something that will exacerbate the uh, regional inequalities, as something that will drain the capital resources from the developing world to the industrialized world. And the leading uh, proponents of that form of globalization were the thinkers and practitioners of the North. Fast forward to the middle of this decade, the main defenders of globalization are from the South, both as nations, as business, as, as understood leaders. And the main skeptic, the most angry respondents to globalization are in the industrialized North. And that how do we explain this? I will walk a few steps. First of all, express, talk to the engine of uh, and popularity of globalization today, but more importantly, talk to the ambiguity and the falsehood that are laying the problems of globalization at the doorstep of trade. And of course, the misfortune that the trade community has not had very good interlocutors on putting the blame to, on globalization is misfortune where it belongs. If I may start by a quote of uh, Warren Buffett, uh, when he said that it's only when the tide is out that we know who has been swimming without trunks, uh, I think we have a similar thing about globalization, that for a long time the inefficient development of an international economic order did not show properly the geographical spread of efficiency, competitiveness high returns on labor, and what technology, particularly a series, a stream, a, a series of uh, international development, which started with the containerization of maritime trade, which uh, almost marginalized the cost of freight, and therefore created the possibility subjectively and economically, economically of interna internationalizing the production process that components of production could be made around the world and shipped to different places for completion, one. And two, the triumph of technology, our payment systems and easier management of our decentralized production processes, denationalized production processes. So, areas of competence being flushed out by enterprise. That it became possible you could identify the most efficient place to produce uh, the motherboard for my computer is going to be in Cambodia, the microchips I can do them in China, and uh, some other component I do in India, but because transporting the components around the region is so, is so easy, it becomes easy to plan on this scale of seeking out areas of competence. And of course the reverse side of it is fleeing from areas of incompetence. That areas of the world's economy where production was mostly based on an equal exchange with other areas of the world, but also substantial subsidies could become exposed for the inefficiency and non-competitiveness. 
but it's built into the narrative of how globalization has moved. But then, there has been two processes. At the one level, of the global crash of 2008, and with the very slow recovery of global uh, economic performance, even slower global trade because of the distortions that have happened since that time, coincides with another phenomenon, which is the leftist, gender left politics of Western Europe and America in the Democratic Party and the Labour Party of Europe fundamentally emphasize the importance of the welfare state subsidizing labor, cushioning the working class, reducing personal exposure to the vulnerabilities of, 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 of the, the, the uncertain marketplace. But from the time of triangulation, the, the, the Clinton Blair doctrine, embracing socialist rhetoric, but uh, very conservative economic policies, and steadily eroding the welfare state. Set the stage where, if vulnerabilities will come to the lower middle class, the state cushion that has traditionally reduced the political impact of those vulnerabilities has been eroded. I think I mention this because I'm trying to come to, to a phenomenon which in a third way could be described as the erosion of the welfare state and the rapid movements of decision making and enterprise taking advantage of globalized production processes reducing a lot of the investment in production in industrial <coughs> countries of the West <coughs> triggered a process that justifiably has explained the anger of those who feel vulnerable and exploited. But that, that this is the narrative that we're not hearing adequately. And in times of crisis, economics gives way to populist, the popularity of populist thinking. Let me just take a quote from a, uh, a book I read about a brief history of the 20th century by uh, uh, a professor in Chicago, I think it's uh, called uh, Oxbaum. He said, if you look at the fall of the Weimar Republic in the 1930s, you'll find that about half of all the democracies of Central Europe also were collapsing at the same time. And what was the reason? That democracy is a fickle ideology, which survives on the promise that next Christmas I'll have more food, better food than I had last Christmas. The ideology that the family will be richer next year gives you the hope and an entrenched interest in protecting the status quo. If you go through a phase where you start getting a sense that fathers will be dying richer than their sons and daughters will ever be, that your children will be poorer than you, then the foundation of that democracy is very vulnerable and can be manipulated by populist process. And his central thesis was the leader to very democratically elected nationalist socialist government in Germany was fundamentally because populism could play up to the vulnerabilities of people who are scared by a sense of diminishing prospects and hope in that period. Fast forward to today, I think there is something not accidental about the possibility when the left politically has abandoned the message of cushion to the working class and the lower middle class. It becomes easier that politicians of the right make the promise of cushioning people from forces that are not domestic. When the middle class has a sense that it is losing out, it becomes vulnerable to manipulation. But usually populism from the left is the one which talks to these vulnerabilities. Today it's the populism of the right that talks to those challenges. And I think in a way, this is my rendition of the phenomenon of rising rightist, uh, whether you're talking about um, Le Pen and the new nationalist party, which is the third largest party in the German parliament today, or Mr. Trump and his, uh, his base. They manipulate a reality 
the reality is globalization has not delivered to everybody. That the global dynamics have made more vulnerable those who most predicted that they were cushioned, who assumed their competitiveness until they were exposed by more efficient producers away from the area and regions of the world. Now, how has this come to relate with trade? First of all, international trade has been an easy one to attack because it is simple to explain in a populist way to an average consumer of political ideology, uh, of ideology and demagogy. That, you know, the thing is that the fact that we are trading with other countries and they are becoming richer is the problem. And our solution has to be to cut that trade. So how is this affecting us today? We are seeing a redefinition of the terms of international engagement in trade. Reviving a focus on uh, mercantilist self-interest and uh, bilateral engagement in a zero-sum kind of game that you think that the world exists because country A must not export to country B more than what country B imports from country A. That's one. Secondly, yeah. at a time when we have had the internationalization of production, the global movement of segments of products, the very essence of something being called uh, made in America is outdated. It doesn't make sense to me to say America is selling iPhones to the world and therefore we balance that with what we sell to America because America holds the intellectual property rights on an iPhone. It does not make iPhones. The iPhone is made in the world. The largest content of an iPhone beyond intellectual property is made in China. And that logically will mean that America should be the most important proponent of rules-based international engagement because it's the most important beneficiary from the protection and the fetish about intellectual property. Because if we break the rules-based system, those who are just in material production processes can be able to sustain it. They look for new markets, they look for new areas of cutting costs, but those who are dependent on the protection of intellectual property rights, like I just met a gentleman who was working with wife for a few moments ago, who will tell you those should be the champions of my multilateral engagement. Now, in my organization, we have been tracking developments around the world. What's happening in multilateralism? A number of things are very clear to us. One, apart from becoming the de facto defenders of multilateralism, the major economies of Asia are leading in new initiatives about how to refinance international dynamics. The return to popularity of development financing, development banks, with the BRICS Bank, with the Asian Development Bank, the Chinese uh, banking institutions, is creating a new momentum in an area that was disappearing in the wake of often very difficult to justify conditionalities and direction of activity by the Bretton Woods institutions. We have just published a trade and development report where we are saying in the past year or so, the global economy is recovering, but it's, it's improving without taking off. It's picking up without taking off. But the uncertainties in the political economy are very, very directly impacting on what are the prospects of this takeoff. One, for the first time since the Second World War, we've just come through a decade when the expansion of international trade has been equal to or less than global GDP growth. In fact, some of us think that the world will be in a much worse situation 
had it not been for the exponential growth of uh, electronic trade, e-commerce, and uh, the digital economy. That is uh, the brightest spot in international trade. But as one pillar, it cannot address underlying risks and the fundamental challenges that are remained unanswered from the time of the crisis in 2007-2008. For example, uh, prescriptions of austerity cannot be a long-term and sole pillar for recovery from global uh, decline. I think it's primarily because of a global desire that we don't want to face the reality. We don't have to accept the reality that the uh, anarchy of the marketplace can only work to a certain point. Uh, a certain form of collective discipline has to be brought to bear in addition to structured choices and access freedoms of our decision makers. While we can look at some of the problems related to trade, the fundamental challenges of global economy's performance have to be seen also in beyond technology and, and, and trade issues. Uh, of course, wrong-footed macroeconomic policies, a delayed response to some of us requiring really discussing the possibilities of a new global order. Are held at bay. But the dilemma of, uh, of this is that at a time when we think we most need to start addressing inequalities in the system that we're having, problems that have inherently been there, we start still having a challenge that politics looks for simple solutions. One of the biggest challenges of the past era of globalization has been concentration of power. It's not just countries, it is enterprise. And it's the growth of a kind of winner-take-all system by the frontiers, the frontier companies in the technological revolution. If I could just share some statistics that we've been looking at. Between 1995 and 2015, surplus profits grew from 4 to 23 percent of total profits for all firms. And between 19 percent and 40 percent for the top 100 firms in the world. In 1995, the market capitalization of the top 100 firms was worth 31 times that of the bottom 2,000. But 20 years later, it has risen to 7 times, 7,000 times. What does it mean? That there's a massive over concentration of global wealth in a very few hands. This is not a challenge uh, of the model of economy, particularly when uh, international uh, economic prosperity is driven by consumption. I mean, 60 percent of global GDP is, is, is accounted for by consumption. But now when you get into a situation where there is an over concentration of wealth, not just in the hands of a few corporations, but also Corporations that are now able to do innovative accounting methods through fictitious acquisitions and mergers to shift, shift their profits around the world in such a way that they impede the ability of the state to tax them. So beyond the politics, that the states are increasingly incapable of tax taxing enterprise. So we, we were looking at a number of interesting examples. How, for example, Culprits have been in the government of Ireland, Luxembourg, and Netherlands, which can negotiate off the record certain concessions with major multilateral corporations, no, major giants. I'm talking about uh, one of the big five, that is uh, Google, Microsoft, and so on, to declare their global headquarters in that territory. But you go to the global headquarters of this company, and it is two-room apartment. Because it is not the headquarters. It's for purposes of accounting that you go into low tax uh, territory so as to evade expensive taxes in other parts of the world. 
It's not an accident at all that one of the first features of uh, uh, the Trump economic team has been to start arguing about moving away from taxing foreign and assets as a way of making American corporations stop shifting their profits around the world and try to shift them towards the American continent. But the fundamental thing is the model of the modern state has always been that through tax revenue, you build the infrastructure for a new economic system, whether it is fiscal infrastructure, uh, broadband uh, fiber, fiber, or it is uh, institutional of learning, or social investment. But the state is having diminishing ability to trap the surpluses from enterprise because of their ability to have multiple uh, passports. Uh, in our World Investment Report two years ago, we showed that the largest corporations in the world have at least four international passports. So depending on the conveniences of taxation regime, they can shift the declarations of where they declare their profits in a way that beats the state. So that is an area that also has to be addressed beyond, beyond the basic understanding of what have been global challenges, we have to start looking at um, how to create a new architecture that can tame the virtual monopoly power that has gone to the concentrated in the hands of the 1% the of the world that have been the riders of the benefits of uh, particularly digital economy. In the wake of this, we must develop a narrative that talks to the protectionism that misreads the challenges of the world. I think within the UN family, we have tried to fashion some language that deals with some of this. I think to a large extent, the ambitions of Agenda 2030, looking at inclusive, socially sensitive and environmentally sustainable models of development curbing the excesses of excessive uh, consumption and seeing the relevance of the most vulnerable as necessary for the long term survival and benefit of the others are talking to some of the challenges around the fears on globalization. But how can we revive the role of trade as a contributor in this conversation? One fundamental, as was mentioned earlier, has been the dysfunction of the multilateral rulemaking system that was started with so much optimism at Uruguay in 1996, the World Trade Organization. That while many developing countries look to this as a possibility of structured, negotiated, development, friendly uh, asymmetry in market access, what we have seen is a promise at one level, but a performance at a totally different level. What we've seen is uh, caricaturing rulemaking. Uh, I had the privilege to be a trade minister many years ago for my country, Kenya. And I always looked at what we were discussing when we went to the ministerial. And uh, then as an under secretary general of the UN, I've attended the last three ministerials. And I see the same rituals that we saw many years ago have been institutionalized. What happens, you call ministers and leaders of delegations to Geneva and show that there's a very important need that we must break, make a breakthrough and the world is dependent on what we do. You go out into this process and when you enter the ministerial, nothing happens. You don't agree on anything important. But then there might be a marginal one or two things that are brought up by some member states. And you reluctantly accept them because you don't want them to veto everything you do. And then you carry those little collection pickings and uh, declare, we have had a breakthrough because of this. I uh, see the best example for me is Bali, uh, Ministerial Conference number nine, uh, four years ago. And what happened in Bali, the developing world was insisting that we must harvest the concrete promise of Doha the development round. Mm -hmm. We must deal with uh, domestic agricultural subsidy and uh, export support. 
and there was paralysis and there was nothing happening and everybody saying if we do not fix this WTO is going to, 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 to be damaged even die then at the end there's agreement on only two things one trade facilitation but because India says we will not give you trade facilitation unless you give us protection waivers or uh, on uh, taking stock, I mean, uh, uh, agriculture stock uh, for, for, for food security. Reluctantly, India is given its way. And then we come out of Bali, and the international media is full of praise stories that another $7 trillion is going to be added to global GDP because of a phenomenal expansion of trade, because of trade facilitation. There was never any promise of that gain on the road to Bali. But because there was nothing else gained out of Bali, you are to show it that's so important that you celebrate that the WTO has made a breakthrough. But they are running out of exchequer. We were discussing now on the road to Buenos Aires on the 10th of uh, December. What will be the, 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 the great thing to come out of it? At one level, of course, I know, there's a red herring. Everybody's saying, you know, Trump's White House does not want multilateral rulemaking. It wants bilateral agreement. And therefore, WTO, unless you show some progress, you are going to lose out. That's a big opportunity for WTO to die. Actually, there is truth to some extent in that threat. But then the flip side of it is this. You can have developing countries being enticed to think that they are the main beneficiaries of rules-based multilateral negotiating system, so they must be the principal stakeholders to make sure that WTO does not die in Buenos Aires. So you say, you are the ones who have to serve WTO from the Trump White House. And that means that you soften the conditions that you bring to the table about what is being negotiated. Otherwise, the alternative route is the Bali route. Right now, with support from FAO and Anstad, the WTO has been negotiating uh, disciplining the, um, subsidies to fisheries. And you can come to, the, to Buenos Aires and for the first time start hearing quantum statistics about the potential addition to global trade because of the reduction of subsidies on some forms of fisheries because you don't have very many other things to celebrate. I'm sorry that this may sound a bit cynical, but I think it points to the need that we have to talk again about what is the purpose of it. We at Anctad say the following. Trade has lifted nearly a billion people out of extreme poverty in India and China. It has been demonstrated that it can work. It can be the trigger for building productive capacity for transformation, for structural transformation of economy, to bring people into the 21st century. The environment under which the developmental component and content of trade has worked is being fouled by extremists, mostly extremist challenges. And therefore, the development community has a collective responsibility to project the positive about trade without taking away the reality that trade also has to be structured in such a way that it doesn't erode the livelihoods of the most vulnerable. Quick fix solutions will not work. But unless we start seeing how we discipline the phenomenal advances of technology in a context of the challenges and ambitions of uh, inclusive prosperity, will be susceptible to the politics of extremism, nativism, and populist injection of international engagement. We are seeing, we are living in an era of phenomenal dramatic change. Uh, when I was launching the World Inve um, Information Economy Report in Geneva three weeks ago, I mentioned to my audience that there are two interesting phenomena. One, that on our watch, data is becoming a more important commodity than petroleum. The phenomenal growth of big data 
and the fact that knowledge is so dramatically and exponentially changing over time. Yeah. The best statistic I have of this is the fact that of all global data, all human knowledge since the start of human civilization up to the year 2015, up to two years ago, is equivalent to 20% of human knowledge on data. 80% is two years old. The oldest of 80% is less than two years old. The phenomenon is uh, mind-boggling. It's beyond easy comprehension. But it calls to question what we call knowledge. Because constantly there's new knowledge and new challenge to our assumption. This phenomenon and the exponential growth of uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, and all the elements of the fourth industrial revolution are calling for new thinking about how we relate in organizing ourselves, how we relate in organizing trade, how we relate to emerging global economic phenomena. I was in uh, Silicon Valley uh, in September, and I visited one factory, and somebody was telling us the critical competition in the world today is who will master artificial intelligence. You may discuss a lot of other things, but if you're not on the frontier of artificial intelligence, in a decade you will be irrelevant. I think that's the way it is. We are still thinking of uh, how to deal with our other vulnerabilities, but how can we combine our responsibilities for the bigger picture <coughs> on the direction that innovation and technology should take us in a collaborative way at a time when hostile thinking, which means like erecting boundaries around self, fear of the other, xenophobia, are gaining currency in international relations. UNCTAD sees our role as modest, but that we can contribute. Our convening power has mainly been about two things. One, allowing for open, even alternative, approaches to global challenges as they face us today. But two, and most importantly, encouraging discussions of collective solutions that are not grounded in any ideology and assumptions that we have to pr protect certain um, uh, certain assumptions that we have held for a long time. So, we look at a situation where the main issues in global trade are going to move away from rule making into normative work and more policy directions that are not written down in negotiated papers. The world has expanded for the past uh, 20 years without a very solid rulemaking, but we will need the important role of dispute resolution mechanisms that are grounded in multilateralism to be the most important phenomenon that to ring fence and protect within the WTO context is the sanctity of that discipline, uh, the, the, the dispute resolution mechanism, which has also come under its own pressure, as, as uh, some of you may know. But disciplining trade and disciplining uh, globalization has also to come with a disciplining global economic governance. I mean, these uh, intermittent actions uh, often uh, around austerity uh, are inadequate for addressing the challenges that have brought us to where we are. And if sluggish recovery gets into another uncertainty, often in, uh, substantially impacted by uh, geopolitical issues, uh, whether in the Middle East or elsewhere, we can get into another situation that leads to another downturn with the resultant growth of more militants and perhaps even the rise in the politics of even more extremist, uh, nativist uh, movements. I say this in Asia because some of us, the main solution we are going to have to come this region. As a source of foreign direct investment, 
Asia has become a significant, not significant, the leading source of FDI for developing countries. As a region with a fastest growing middle class, it, it's a structured consumer economies, like what's being undertaken by Jinping in, uh, in China, will become major markets beyond the traditional commodities for the developing world. And the notions that have informed the traditional expectations from leadership from other parts of the world will have to give way to new engagement, structured, but also with solidarity economies and the possibilities of technology that have brought this heightened role to the region have to feed into new initiatives. On the China side, we are seeing the Belt and Road Initiative with its substantial ambitions. But we have to see significant initiatives, uh, recent uh, and found between uh, Japan and India, uh, representing also very, very significant axis that has to be looked at as potentially an important development in the context of uh, multilateralism. While North-North cooperation led to the great success of the Second World War, the booster engine and recovery out of global uh, sluggish recessed uh, economies is most likely going to come from uh, concerted efforts from within the emerging economies, which is members of the BRICS family and other economies in the Asia region in the different configurations. Uh, I'm sorry that I've gone a long way, but I just wanted to share the sense that um, we're in the middle of a, a very difficult moment, a very unique historical epoch, but we are seeing a great, great hope, hope, not in the traditional areas where we used to look for hope, but in uh, those who are skeptics of globalization, but have become the main champions of globalization. Rules-based system, rules-based engagement, addressing the, the weaknesses of technology without, a, without a governance. Building in the public sphere dialogue about things that we never thought we needed to do. How do we sustain the growth of the solidarity economy, you know, uh, peer shared economy, with limited state ability to understand the movement of goods and services, and therefore even the ability to regulate quality, let alone to tax adequately. And these are areas that are going to call for greater engagement, but also giving a lot of attention to the new knowledge that is phenomenally being produced on a daily basis uh, and informing who succeeds and who fails. Thank you for your kind attention.